And it's my absolute pleasure to be interviewing one of America's most successful primetime network series showrunners. Uh, when Julie Pleck was 12 years old, she'd already decided that she wanted to work in Hollywood. Uh, she read Premier Magazine, uh, she watched E.T. seven times, and woe betide anyone who rang her when L.A. Law was on the box. <laughs> Uh, but it was, when, when, uh, it, was a, it was the moment when Freddy Krueger's tongue licked someone down a telephone line in uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, some of you might remember, uh, that she knew there was only one genre for her, and that was going to be horror. She's now responsible for the brilliant Vampire Diaries, which will come to an end at the end of this season, eight years after it first debuted in the US. She also makes its spin-off series, The Originals, and she was also responsible for Belgian drama remake Containment, which is now showing on E4 in the UK. At one point a few years ago, oh, I should also mention a particular favourite of mine, a, a remake she made of 70s classic The Tomorrow People, which you might get to, uh, to talk about as well. At one point a few years ago, by all accounts, she was overseeing 44 episodes a year, or working 18 hours a day. But fortunately, she has found time to come and see us today. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you would please welcome Julie Pleck. Very nice. <laughs> Did I get it right? Yeah. The, right. Oh, 99%. No, okay, well, that... I'll sell, I'll sell it for that. Uh, right, I'm going to ignore the current fashion for non-linear storytelling by, uh, it's far too complicated at this time in the morning. So, uh, <laughs> so we're going to go right back to the beginning. Uh, Julie, I mentioned there that you, you were convinced at an early age that you, you wanted to work in, in, in Hollywood. Yeah, it's, um, I think I went from wanting to be a professional tennis player at age 11, before I even really knew how to play tennis, to wanting to be a broadcast anchor at age 12, and then by by the end of my 12th year, realizing that uh, something in the movies, in the movie business or the TV business was it for me. I just didn't know what. I just All I knew was, Hollywood, let's get there. <laughs> You've described yourself as like a, a kind of a queen of pop culture, even at, even at that young age. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, I mean, when you're a kid in the 80s, um, you sort of are deeply embedded in pop culture just by definition of breathing air. You know, it was such a time with fads and, you know, and music and everything and, and the, the movies and, you know, that just, just by living, you're, you, you can retain that information until the end of time. So between Spielberg and John Hughes and, you know, all those great movies and, and everything that was happening, I, I just always was deeply obsessed with all things entertainment. Uh, and you had the ambition, and plenty of people have that ambition, but I don't know how realistic was it to, to, for you to, tr to try and do that. What was your background? Did you have a showbiz family? No, or? not at all. I, I grew up, I was uh, mostly in the suburbs of Chicago. Um, I, my parents had nothing, nothing, nobody in my family had anything to do with the business. Um, I just loved movies and television, and I, like you said, prescribed to all the, subscribed to all the magazines. And... Um, and did theater, and, and I was in, in plays and in musicals. I was terrible, but I was in them. And I, I just loved everything about it. And so I just kind of always knew that's what I wanted to do. And then so I actually went to university in order to, to study film and television, um, <clears throat> knowing that you know at least that was a means to an end. And when I graduated, I just kind of I finished up the summer waiting tables, and then I hit the road and went to LA, no job, no home. Yeah, just what what went. was your big break there? I mean, how did, how, well, what did you? I mean, what did your family think when you did that? And what, what were you? Th what were you thinking, Julie? <laughs> My parents are still sort of like, so what do you do? Um, <laughs> how does that work? Uh, it was honestly, you know, when you're 22, you're fearless. You know, you're right out of school. You've got you know seven dollars in your bank account. If I didn't have a degree where you get recruited out of university by like a consulting company or a business company and there's no master's program that I needed and so I, you just have to go do. And I contemplated staying in Chicago. It's got a really rich theater community there um, and working in some capacity in the arts but the lure of Hollywood has sort of called for me since I was a kid and so I just went and I, every day, I was living in Manhattan Beach which is about, you know, it's about 45 minutes south of, of Hollywood, and um, and I was living on my cousin's couch, who was who had just graduated from university as well. And every day I would drive up into West Hollywood and sit at Jerry's Deli, which is um, it no longer there, but uh, just I drove by the other day, it's gone. I'm like, what happened? Um, but I would sit at Jerry's Deli and I would get, I would pay for a Hollywood Reporter and the Variety, which are the two trade magazines. Uh, and I would go and I would read the news and I would look at the WAN ads, and then I would go to the Kinkos um, in Beverly Hills and I would fax my resume to any job. Um, and I still, that Kinko's, like I drive by it, I'm like, oh, that's the Kinko's. Still yeah, still there. <laughs> um, 
But it just was so thrilling because I was in Beverly Hills, you know, and, and uh, I had, I was uh, my freshman year at university, 90210, Beverly Hills 90210 started, and I was one of two women in my dorm salon room watching the first episode. And by the end of the season, there were like 40 girls in there, and, and there were people, not just girls. And I thought, like, I don't know, I just felt part of something, part of a movement. So I was in Beverly Hills at the Kinkos, and I just got a job, which, by the way, I learned later. You cannot get a job in the one ads of the, I mean, they're terrible, crap jobs. There's nothing there um, from the trades. Like, people don't advertise for jobs in the trades. They have job lists that are secret and they get passed around by all the agencies and stuff. Um, <laughs> but I got a job. Yeah, what was your break? You worked at an agency? Yeah, it was, a, right? it, was a, it was a boutique agency, a talent and lit agency. And my boss, Susan Smith, was, um, was, had been in the business for 40 years and was very, um, very well known and had a, a nice client list. And, and it was a crazy job, and I, I went in saying, um, somebody gave me a piece of advice right before I left town. They said, if anybody asks you what you want to do, you look them dead in the eye and you say exactly what it is that they do, you know, if you're interviewing for jobs. So she said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to be an agent. And um, lie, just a lie, and I don't lie, so I can't believe I got away with it. Um, but it worked, and she gave me the job, and then when I left four months later, because it was miserable. Um, you didn't want to be an agent. I, and she said, I thought you wanted to be an agent. And I was like, I did, but. I just don't think I want it anymore, you know. <laughs> um, and was that when you moved to, to Wes Craven's company, is that right? Yes, so I had my only business connection in, in, in the entertainment industry uh, was a woman who was my cousin's sorority sister at school. And she had come to uh, visit with my cousin once and I'd met her. And I'd heard she'd moved out to California and that she was working as, as Wes Craven's assistant. And you mentioned the, you know, the Freddy Krueger, and that was my, that's what I knew about Wes Craven at the time. And, um, and so I looked her up once I had my job, and I said, if there's ever you know, anything, you want to grab coffee or whatever. And she was producing an improv show, uh, like just a little comedy show. Um, and I sold tickets at the door for her. I volunteered, and I, I, I impressed her. <laughs> with my ticket selling skills. And so she said, you know, I've just been promoted and I'd like to find a new assistant for Wes. Would you be interested? And I remember thinking like, well, I don't want to be a director. And, and it's funny, you're 99% because I didn't particularly love horror. I, I just knew and loved Nightmare on Elm Street. Right. And I said, so I don't really, you know, I don't know what I could learn in this job, you know, but yes, give it to me because I am desperate to get out of the one I had. Um, and, and she got it for me. And then that just started everything. Yeah, and then you went on to meet uh, Kevin Williams. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I spent I spent four years all told working for uh, Wes and his partner Marianne, and um, and within that Kevin came into our world through um, Scream, which at the time was called Scary Movie, and uh, and I met him and, and we made that movie. I was Wes's assistant. I was on location. It was my first movie, and Kevin it was his first movie as a screenwriter. So we were just like two happy, excited kids. We're making movies, you yeah. know, and um, and we became good friends, and then that kind of like that began that relationship. And did Ke Kevin at one point said, "Yeah, and I've got this idea for a show, maybe." He was yes, doing a pilot. yes, he was. He was saying, "Yeah, they want me to write um, a script about like growing up in the creek, you know, <laughs> um, and uh, it, you know, the story of him as like this young aspiring filmmaker in a small town in North Carolina, um, which is where you know he's from, and and how he had a crush on the girl down the creek who used to row her boat over, and and." Um, and I said, well, that sounds good. <laughs> and then from that, Dawson's Creek, you know, sort of came to life. And was that really where you learned, was, it, was that a key part of where you learned your trade, uh, Dawson's Creek? 100%. Yeah. I, worked, I worked on Dawson's Creek with Kevin for one year and one year only. Um, but it was, it was ultimately where I realized, looking back, that I became a writer. I wasn't a writer on the show. Um, I didn't believe myself to be a writer at all. But we were so behind all the time <laughs> that people would just throw me, like we would, be, you write this, you write that, you write that, and he would say to me, like, you help me with this, and so I'd just be like, D -d 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 -d, you know, and have like handing scenes over, and, and when all is said and done, enough that I wrote actually made it on the air, uh, that later, many years later, when I thought, oh, what am I gonna do, you know, for a living now, um, I thought, oh, I, I could write, you know, Dawson said some of my stuff, like people liked it. Yeah, because yeah. you, you wanted to work in Hollywood, but you didn't want to be a writer first of all, is that right? No, that's, it's that's terrible. That's a great, great quote you said, uh, there's one thing I don't want to be <laughs> yeah. is a writer. I was terrible. Yeah. And, and maybe I was terrible and, and I just got better, or maybe I was just really dumb and, <laughs> and not aware that I actually was doing something good. But I just, I always take it back to this, it's, it's a perfect example, Greg, 
Berlanti, who is one of my friends, who's big, you know, Flash, Arrow, uh, Supergirl, also Dawson's Creek, and like he's, you know, a mogul. Um, he took a playwriting class at, at Northwestern where we went to school, and he loved it. And he said it's the class that like cemented his love for writing and proved to him that he know that he could do it. And I took the same class the, the next year, and it was the worst. I couldn't like. I hated everything about it. I didn't understand anything. I went to write my play, and it was so bad. And like, and I wrote it in like a day because I was too scared, you know, to do it any earlier. And when when he gave it back to me, the professor, he just sort of was like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I think I got like a C in the class, like a C in a playwriting class. Like it was not my finest moment. And I thought, well, okay, good. Now we know. Like that's one thing that you'll never be able to do. Good on you. <laughs> and uh, and that car I carried that with me for ten years. Tw yeah, ten years at least. And that professor became a character in Vampire Diaries. Yeah, <laughs> killed <laughs> early. <Yeah>. Yes. <laughs> It sounds, it sounds incredibly unconventional the way you got into it. Is, is that just the way it happens in, in Hollywood, or is that, is, that, is that actually quite an unusual part? No, it's just super <laughs> unusual. There's, yeah. there's a small handful of people like me who kind of came up through the, what I'd call the executive ranks. You know, I was a development executive, a D-girl, whatever you want to call it. Um, and, and through that line, I was able to produce. And so I got to be a producer before I was a writer. And what's nice about television is, you know, writers turn into producers and showrunners are sort of the boss of everything. And so um, I got to skip like this whole line, you start as a staff writer, then you get promoted to story editor, and then to this. So there, there's a seven year run of working your way up the ladder as a writer before you even are a, sort of a, considered an executive producer. And I got to just skip all that, right, and dive right. right in, which is nice. <laughs> And you mentioned Greg Belanti, but you were you yeah. were kind of friends with him at college. Is that yeah, right? yeah, From yeah. An early age, so yeah. it's amazing that you, these two kind of talents. It, it's were kind of wild. Really long, I mean, like, it's Greg, I always say, I always said to my friends, like, I'm not a writer. Greg's a writer. Greg wakes up in the morning and writes, and he like whether he's journaling or writing short stories or working on a play or whatever, he just is always writing. And I wake up in the morning and I'm like late <laughs> already, and I like race my ass to work, and then I work all day including writing, but it's work, you know, and then I'm like, thank God that's over, and I go to bed and I do it all the next day. And, um, but he was, when we were at school, he was an actor as well, so I was, a, I was the assistant stage manager of a play that he was an actor in, and he had to get, like, fully naked, except for, like, a loincloth, and then smear mud all over himself. It was this weird performance art piece. It was dreadful. Um, but, like, that's, that's how we became friends, and he, had, he was right. like, hey, I wrote a play. Would you read it? And I, and I read his play, and I gave him notes, and and he always talks about like how from that moment on I was always the person that he wanted to get notes from. And so when he moved to LA, about six months after me, he moved in down the street. And then a year later, year and a half later, I got an apartment and he came to visit and he liked the building. So he moved in down the hall. And so every night I'd, I'd get home from work when I was working for Wes and I would go into his place and we'd order Chinese food and we'd talk about story. And he would like, you know, we'd, we'd, he's like, let's write this or let's come up with this story. And he came up with a whole movie about our friendship that we sold. Never got made. It was good though. Um, <laughs> But uh, that was his big break into the business, was pitching that right. with Kevin. And Kevin said, well, I need to legitimize him. He's nobody. He's never worked a day in his life as a writer, but this is a really good idea, so how do we legitimize him? And he goes, oh, I'll put him on Dawson's Creek. And so he hired Greg to go on Dawson's Creek as a staff writer so that he could say to everyone you know, about town when we were pitching this big idea, oh, he's my mentor. I'm his mentor. And, uh, and then Greg sold the pitch for like a million dollars, and it was this big, big break. So that film script is there. Have you still got it in a in a in a safe? Yes, somewhere? it's yeah. so good. It's it's uh, it's funny. It's called Her Leading Man, and it was about um, a gay man who t who decides his desperate desperately single female best friend um, <laughs> needed needed the perfect mate, and so he like he and all his gay friends decide to like sort of. Um, my fair lady, you know, uh, uh, the, this like rough and tumble basketball coach to make the perfect boyfriend. And it's so great. And I remember we go to the studio and the studio's like, it's just a little gay. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and can you just scale back on the gay a little bit? And we were like, no, we can't. And then within a year, it was like Queer Eye for the Straight Guy was on the air. And then everything's gay. Everything's so great and gay all the time now. But 10 years ago or 12 years ago, it was not as exciting right. to people. <laughs> Maybe one day we'll see it. Yeah, if we're lucky. Okay, well, let's, let's, see, let's see some of your work now. I uh, oh. want to turn to your shows. Uh, I should say congratulations on The Vampire Diaries. Thank you. That's uh, eight seasons, uh, 171 episodes, uh, which is staggering. Uh, and it's, it's rather different to the way uh, shows are made over here, I think. Um, 
And you've also launched the spin-off series, the originals, yes. which, which we'll talk about in a bit. And that's currently in production on its, on its fourth. Do you want to talk, before we talk about the show, do you want to talk about that scene in particular? Or no, it's, it's, it's hard so to funny. say, no spoilers. It's funny with those, you know, that's from um, early in season six. And uh, I just love when the boys are committed. Like, when they really dial into a scene, you just feel it. And, and it was nice to see that again. Because they're, they, they re- they're so good, and they, you know, when they're really connected, it just kind of jumps off the screen. So it premiered on the, on the CW in uh, seven years ago, 2009. Yeah. Um, so give, give us a sense how it came about. It was actually it was, it was such a... My whole career has been so serendipitous that, you know, <laughs> let's just keep going with that. But uh, so Kevin and I had worked together, obviously, back in Dawson's Creek time. And then we split up um, and spent many years kind of doing our own thing and, and remained friends but kind of grew a bit more distant. And then he had a friend who died, and, uh, and it was really tragic. And, and I went to the funeral, and I hadn't seen Kevin for a bit of time. And, and we reconnected at the funeral and in the days thereafter where I was just kind of always around. And, and we have a mutual friend named Jennifer Breslow, who at the time was working for the CW, and she was around as well. And she said, why don't we all just go have lunch? Let's like, you know, make sure, she would call me and she'd say, let's make sure that you know, we're connecting with Kevin and that, we're, like, that he knows we're here. And, um, and so we went and had just a friend lunch, and we were just kind of chitting and chit-chatting and, and, and talking about Twilight, which was about to come out. And I think True Blood had just started, and Kevin was watching True Blood, and I was reading Twilight. And the conversation came up about vampires in, 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 in movies and television. And I said, well, no one's going to do another vampire thing. It's too bad, because I like vampire stuff. And, and she's like, well, actually, we've got, you know, the CW has this book we've been trying to crack, and we've just not been able to find writers that we like for it. And Kevin had remembered it being submitted to him as a movie, uh, movie uh, project a couple years prior and had passed, but he remembered the basic concept. And, uh, and she, looked at, she looked at both of us, or she looked at, yeah, she looked at both of us and said, do you guys want to do it? And he was like, no. <laughs> and I said, yeah. And he goes, all right, yeah. <laughs> and, and she's like, don't excuse my language, don't fuck with me. Like, I'm going to go sell this right now and with you guys if you want to do it. And he said, look, I, you know, yes. And I said, heck yes. And, uh, and she did. She walked. We were at Arnie Morton's, which is in Burbank, and there's, like, the distance between that restaurant and her office was about 40 yards. And so she's like, I'm walking those 40 yards, and I'm making 10 phone calls, and then the job is yours. And, um, and that's, it was just born out of a friend lunch. And you, made, you went on to make a, a pilot first, presumably. Yeah, so you always, um, the system is, you know, you, you sell the pitch, and then you write the pilot, and then you make the pilot if you're lucky. Um, and then if the pilot's good, then it gets ordered to series. And so we, it, and it all happens in like this really super stupidly compressed amount of time um, where you're competing against, you know, 17 other pilots like yours. But uh, that was the year they did Melrose Place and Us. And there was one more the CW put on the air, and I can't, oh, Beautiful People. Beautiful People lasted three episodes. Melrose Place lasted less than a season, and we lasted 171. eight years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and at the time, People magazine said it was kind of dark. It said darker than Twilight, but less graphic than True Blood. But I mean, I, I guess it's it's not, not always um, easy to, com- to compare the shows. But I guess it made it easier, but also more difficult the fact that these other vampire shows are out there. Because yeah, well, nobody really wanted to take us seriously, which I understand. And so, and we were sort of like Kevin used to say, he's like, "This is we're either going to be the ones that put the nail in the genre, like we are going to be the ones that kill the genre completely and get mocked for for trying it, or we'll hang in there." And you know, it all depends on the sort of you know the saturation point of the audience, which apparently was eternal at that point. Um, and uh, and so, you know, our frustration, frankly, came out of, by the time we, like, got our bearings and realized what we were doing, and it took a couple episodes to kind of dial into what the show really was, but once we got there, we were like, God, this is good. Like, we're proud of this. This is really good. And then you see, like, Twilight, you know, so massive, and True Blood winning all the awards, and you're like, well... We're good too, you know. And um, you know, I thought I just said to him like, if we could get naked and, and swear, we'd be we'd be right there with True Blood. We'd be right there next to him on the you know the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. <laughs> uh, now, what did Kevin? How did he describe it? So he he said it's um, uh, about a town's underbelly and what lurks beneath the surface. Uh, and uh, I think again, talking about it at the time, he said he wanted it to be like a, a modern day sexy soap opera. Yeah, he had grown up watching Dark Shadows. And, and he loved it, and he loved the sort of fun soapiness of that. And I, we both grew up, he and I, watching soaps. I watched daytime, and he watched nighttime. Um, and so we had a, a 
very strong foundation in that kind of twisty, turny storytelling, you know, and, and, and I say half of the tricks that I've learned, I learned from General Hospital and, and other soap operas, you know, taking the villain and turning them into the hero and vice versa, and she's not your daughter, she's your sister, you know, like that, that <laughs> kind of stuff. And oh, you think they're dead? They're not dead, there they are, they're back again, you know, and again. Um, but it's fun, it's delicious, and it's, and it's a roller coaster, and, and that's really a great ride. And so when you put that with like good coming of age, grounded emotion, and these deep themes, like, you know, he, Kevin always said it's a show about loss, and it really is. I mean, for, for us both, it's a show about grief, um, and a show about love and about, and about a deep, deep-rooted fear of, of dying alone, you know? And so when you, when you add all that heft into that and into that great soapy kind of context, you get a, you get a pretty entertaining show. Yeah, because re-watching that, uh, that very first episode, uh, it's also got the great start with the, the two guys in the, in the car and they run someone over who yeah. turns out to be a vampire. Uh, but, but also, it's, uh, it's, it kind of gently eases you into it, I, I, my, my impression was. And uh, it, you mentioned John Hughes. It kind of reminded me a bit of the kind of flavour of it and it felt like a sort of teen high school Yeah, yeah. I mean, teen, teen, stuff is, is, teen stuff is hard because the tone, it's so important to get the tone right. And, and I remember at the very beginning, we wrote a lot of it. We had kind of like a little poppy flair to it. And the deeper you get into the season, the first season, you realize like that those poppy flares kind of tend to go away because it never felt right tonally to have it like Mean Girls had come out, you know, within the last few years. And 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 Buffy, of course, was so kitschy and fun. And so my instinct was to write very poppy. And Kevin, of course, made a whole career out of that. But we kept stripping that back and stripping it back. And you know, basically with the exception of Damon, who got all the zingers, everybody else sort of settled into a very sort of grounded, natural rhythm and, 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 and uh, uh, vocabulary. Like there wasn't a lot of sort of made up words that, you know, and, and that kind of mean girl's fun. So you felt almost like you didn't need that kind of um, that crutch of the, yeah. the pop references. You could actually just let it live, breathe, and live, live and breathe. Like yeah, that. and it's funny because you don't realize what a crutch it is until you're trying not to use it. And um, and it was a discovery that we made along the way. And and it became hard to write for a little while because you didn't have that kind of. It, you realize that we all can easily make a kitschy joke or be kicky and fun and sassy, and and that's the easy place to go to. So how do you stay in the real place? And uh, I was determined to mention this because I, I loved it. Because uh, you, you did a film before this, a uh, kind of high school film, Teaching Miss Tingle, didn't you? With, uh, oh, yeah, that Kevin. Was, yeah, that was Kevin's, Kevin's directorial well. right, debut. Right. Which was fantastic. You know? yeah. <laughs> uh, I loved it. But. That was a good, that was a fun time. Um, so that was the first episode. Uh, and now uh, you've had eight seasons, each one, most of them running to, to 22 episodes. How, how do you just. How do you sustain it? I imagine when you did that pilot, you weren't thinking, right, this is what I'm going to do in episode 171. Yeah, no, um, we, you know, we sort of, when we started, we we're like, we don't really know what the second episode is. We're just going to wing it. And then we got in the middle of the first season, and we were like, how the hell are we going to do this again? Like, there's no way we're going to do this again. And then we got to the second season. Every year, you're like, oh, I don't know, this could be it, you know? And then that idea hits where you're like, oh, I know how to end, and then I know how to get into the next season. So it's, but it's touch, it's touch and go all the time. Um, and, you know, you just... The way that this, the creative system is built, and this is me being a little soapboxy, but, um, but it drives me crazy, is because the pilot process is so condensed, you really don't have time to understand what your series is before you're actually making the series. You claim you do, you're supposed to deliver like a big pitch document or whatever, but it's all bullshit, you know? So the, the idea of like then getting thrown in with like six weeks prep to doing 22 episodes, which then gives you maybe a five minute break before you've got as go in and do 22 episodes all over again, you're basically skating on, like, flying by the seat of your pants for sure, but skating on very thin ice the entire time. You're just hoping to how it works. And that is how you make television in America. <laughs> Kevin Spacey said a few years ago when he came over to deliver the McTaggart lecture here, he said um, he famously didn't make a pilot for House of Cards. He just went straight in and was commissioned for the whole lot. Uh, and he said it's much better that way. You know, get rid of the pilots, just go yeah. for it. And it sounds like you know, maybe you have some sympathy with that. He yeah. said it's more natural just to start from the beginning. And it is. I mean, the, here's, what, here's what you learn in a pilot. You learn, you learn that you hate everyone's hair. And you learn that all the choices you made for wardrobe, you'll live to regret. And you learn sometimes that maybe an actor that you chose is not the right way to go. Um, 
but mostly you learn that it's hell and, and, and you've had to do it in five minutes and you're exhausted and now you've got to call, make a series. So I, I do think that there needs to be some sort of like trial period to make sure everything works because if you've written too many scripts, the other thing is, you know, as writers, you, the most successful writer-actor pairing on a TV show is when you kind of, at least for me, is when I can hear the actor's voice and then kind of write into the actor's voice. And so you, until you have that person, you don't necessarily know what your character sounds like. Um, so it's, you know, it, it, it helps a little bit, but not enough. And you can't possibly write this whole series by yourself. So I'm really interested to find out a bit about the writer's room and how that works. Yeah. It's, a, it's a more of a phenomenon in the, in the US, of course, than, than it is uh, over here. The <coughs> tried it occasionally, <coughs> excuse me, tried it occasionally in the UK. Um, give us a sense how that works, because the closest I come to watching it in action is on the Larry Sanders show. You know, that's, oh. that's, the, that's the closest <laughs> yeah. I come to the writer's it's, room. But. It's not, you know, comedy, comedy rooms and drama rooms are very different. Comedy rooms are a bunch of, you know, like the, the, the cigar smoking fat guys that are like, eh, this is funny, you know. Um, but uh, <laughs> drama rooms are, drama rooms, usually, like my, my rooms are about eight to ten people, and it's a big conference table. Um, some people like to do couches and stuff. I don't believe in couches and games. I don't believe in like little Nerf footballs and, 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 and foosball. Because to me, I'm like, if we're in here, let's work. Let's not, you know, we can go play foosball tomorrow. Um, but uh, surrounded by whiteboards. It used to be cork boards. Now it's, now it's whiteboards. We used to take index cards and push pins and different colored index cards. And so you like put up all your different story beats and like color coded index cards on the cork boards. Now we have like big honking magnetic cards that you write with a dry erase and you can like slap it up on the board and throw it at the board and it sticks. So literally, if you're like, let's see what sticks, it can stick, it actually <laughs> sticks. Um, but what we do is, you know, at the beginning of a season or at the end of the previous season, depending on when we want to get started, we just start talking about, okay, where have we left off and where are we going? And we do a lot of conversation about just the broad strokes of the season. Who's our villain? What are our characters going to go through? What big sort of tentpole moments do we want to see this year? And then once we start giving that a shape, then we start to sort of being able to plant flags, flags in what I'll call the sort of tent poles of the season itself. And so if we can kind of plant three or four flags, then we start breaking the whole season down into chapters. So I'll say, oh, chapter one is usually like episode one to anywhere from like six through nine, depending on the story and, and, and how it wants to take shape. And then, you know, so any given season that I do either has three or four chapters, depending on the structure of the story. And you don't necessarily know going in because you don't know the sustainability of your villain and you know these little character arcs, but it's a good place to start. And then once you've started, once you've kind of broken it into broad stroke chapters, then you can suddenly look at like, okay, here's chapter one. Now, what's the arc of these six episodes or seven episodes? Then suddenly everything starts to get just a tiny bit easier because instead of looking at 22, when you're you're just sort of a deer in headlights, you you. Now we're looking at six, which, okay, that's like a long movie. I can do this, right? It's, you can break it into like three acts. Um, and then once you understand that, you start with the episode. And the, the way a writer's room works in my room, everybody's different. In my room, we talk and we talk and we talk and we talk. And I say, ooh, I like that. You know, I say that my, I'm, I'm, everyone says in my room, they're like, oh, you're so brilliant at this. I'm like, no, you guys are brilliant at it. I'm brilliant at harvesting your brilliance, you know, like, and not everybody can do that. So I will, I will acknowledge that it is a skill, you know, and I, I like can feel good about it, but it's really me being like, mm, I don't have it. I don't have it. And then listening and then being like, Ooh, that's good. That's that idea is good. That idea is good. And here's how we're gonna put them together. And here's how this is going to work. And just, we start shaping the big ideas of the episode. And then it's whoever's the writer of the episode, because we all we rotate assignments, will then kind of take charge of the room and start to build the blocks of their story. And the, they'll start to run it even more than I do, and I kind of sit back and I get pitched at or I listen. Um, and we just, you know, break scene by scene and go from there, and then we do it all over again. <laughs> and you have the rushes playing in the, on a monitor in the corner. Yeah, in the, in the, 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 the way, there's a TV up in the corner that we, we put the dailies on, um, on unmute and we just kind of I'll be in the middle of a story pitch and I'll look up and be like oh the hair the hair you know um, <laughs> or like oh god that's you know that looks so pretty here oh that looks amazing or oh it's so overlit like anything will distract me but it's nice to at least like watch them that dailies like if you watch dailies um, you know it's like two and a half hours out of your day that nobody has and so it's impossible I don't even know why they exist because who's who's got time to watch them you know right. <laughs> 
Uh, and you've talked about other writers' rooms, uh, like a, you said you'd heard like a, or you, one, you hear a million horror stories about hierarchies and who's, who's, who can talk, who can't talk, who's yeah. supposed to be quiet, you know. I mean, you don't play by the rules, but how bad does it get, you know? How can, how can they possibly operate like that? I've literally heard stories. Well, I actually, I experienced a story where <laughs> these poor guys, they were like staff writers, these two really energetic, great, amazing this writing team who I loved and adored, and the showrunner sent an email to one of them being like, you are a story editor, which is like low, low, low level. I am a showrunner in all caps. You do not speak unless I ask you a question. And like just took him to task. And I was like, you know what, dude, you are like, he's, I did not like him. I thought that that was, I thought that he was like old school. I think that's a really old school sensibility. The idea that the hierarchy dictates who gets to speak because hierarchy doesn't dictate talent, you know? More often than not, your brightest, freshest, newest voice is at the bottom because they're not burnt out, they're not jaded, and they're, they haven't like sort of escalated themselves into Hackville. You know, we all get very hacky. You know, years and years, it's exhausting. You know, you run out of your best ideas, you get tired, and so the higher up the ladder you get, the worse you get at your job. You know, <laughs> so the idea that you're like you pitch squeak, you must remain silent. You know, is is nonsense to me, and I hate it because I got to skip all those levels and I skipped growing up through the food chain, I don't buy into the food chain. Um, unless, you know, if someone's like, won't shut up and their ideas suck, then you're like, hey, listen, maybe you give, you know, the bosses a bit more time to speak, but it's really just code for your ideas suck, you know? Um, and I, I, I just love the whole idea. It can be a free for all because I, I'm, not, I'm not above being like, Psh, quiet. You know, <laughs> just like everyone shuts up while I close my eyes and like try to see it in my head. And so if you've got someone running the room that's um, willing to say, I hate that, or I love that, you know, that can, that has the power to say, that's the idea that we're gonna go with. It can be wrong, I'm wrong every six minutes, you know? Like, that's the one, and then we go down that road, and I'm like, mm, nope, that was not the one, sorry. And then we recorrect, and that's, but you've gotta have someone at the center who's got such a strong point of view um, that can handle the melee. Okay, great. Well, Vampire Diaries began in 2009, and then in, uh, in 2013, the originals came along. Yes. Why did you want to make the originals? You know, the originals came out of a, just a phenomenally successful set of casting choices. Um, the villain, Klaus, who was the one, you know, getting the beat down and then fighting back, was the big bad evil of our second and third season. And um, and in trying to hold off on introducing him, we spent most of second season talking about Klaus and how, who's Klaus, and Klaus is so scary, and everyone was so terrified of Klaus, so we're building up the anticipation of this character. And in doing so, we introduced um, an intermediary character named Elijah, who was sort of Klaus's emissary. And so we meet this Elijah, who's just supposed to, for us, stall for seven episodes until we meet, we truly meet Klaus. But Daniel Gillies, who played Elijah, was so good and so special that we thought, okay, so this character's more than just a filler. He's something important. Well, why don't we make him brother to Klaus? And so then we introduced and we cast Joseph Morgan eight episodes later as Klaus. And then Joe comes in and he's so talented. He's just, I mean, he's just incredibly powerful. And so we have these two amazing thespians doing this great work and the, now they're playing brothers and so then we thought well shoot you know they're brothers like what's their story who are the original who's the original family and then we introduced um, a sister and then we introduced an entire storyline about the history of this family and when we were making the sort of origin story of their family in the vampire diaries I watched the episode and I was like this is a, this is a show and, and everyone's like, no, no one needs another vampire show. And so I kind of shut up about it. And then later that year, we did another episode where they were all, the entire family was together at a party and took a picture of them lined up on the staircase. And I was like, this is a show. And I was having lunch with my boss, Peter Roth, at Warner Brothers. And he, he was saying that Mark Pedowitz had said, hey, if you ever want to spin off anything, you know, I'd be open to it. This is the CW. And I said, oh, good, because I have an idea. And pitched it to Peter at the table. And then like a day later, sent him that picture, the family photo. And he, went, he called Mark. And Mark was like, yep, I'm in. And then I just kind of came up. Then I had to come up with the idea. Um, it took a year from that moment, and a full year, to actually get deals made and make sure that you know, we could get it all done. And then I, then I had to come up with the show. And then we shot it. 
How difficult is it? How, how much more complex is it making a, a spin-off show, a prequel? Because you've already got the existing property. I guess you don't want to... Uh, well, hopefully the new show's a success, yeah. but you don't, you know, you don't want to affect the original show. It's got to be similar, but it's got to be different. It's a whole, whole set of challenges. Yeah, I mean, the, the challenge of just being consistent enough with the mythologies and the rules that we had set, especially with magic, because both shows deal so much in magic and, like, trying to, like, deal with those rules um, and not, you know, not retell stories that we'd already told. But the show is tonally so different and, and it's much more grown up. Uh, it's grittier, it's darker, it's, you know, it's more sort of potent. And so that ultimately wasn't that hard. What was hard was we did, and I wouldn't do this again, we did the first episode as like sort of a proof of concept. It's called an embedded pilot, um, which is it was an episode of Vampire Diaries where like 70% of the story was the originals pilot episode. Um, and then so when we launched the originals as a series, the network said, by the way, like you can't anticipate that anybody saw the Vampire Diaries. You have to write a first episode that catches, that like tells the audience who's never seen this before who these people are. And that turned into the hardest thing to do because for, we had three years of mythology and backstory and character you know, growth that we had to figure out how to encapsulate in a pilot. We basically had to remake a pilot. And I was like, well, why the hell did we go through the whole problem of doing the first one if we got to redo it? That was terrible. Um, but once we crossed that hurdle, we were, we were golden. Uh, you mentioned all the mythologies in the show there and all the kind of backstory you've built up. And also, you, you've spoken about how sometimes you, you, you've made life very difficult for yourself by uh, having all these different things. Which you, and, and in the social media age and in the on-demand age where people re-watch programs again and again and again, you can't get away with stuff. You can't make one kind of yeah. law no. of the universe and then ignore <laughs> it five seasons later. No, you get, you get slaughtered. That's the, that's the fun, though. I mean, when you get... We try so hard to make sure we never break our own rules. So there's nothing more humiliating when you don't mean to break a rule and then someone on Twitter points it out to you and you're like, shoot. Um, Block. Yeah, yeah. But, but the time, yeah. <laughs> if I can't hear it, it didn't happen, right? Um, but part of the fun of like getting ourselves out of a bind is figuring out our defense for why we broke the rule. So like w when we actively decide to break a rule where we're like, it doesn't matter that we're breaking it because we know we're breaking it and here's why and bing, bing, bing. So if, if they come at me at Twitter, I've got my defense, you know? Um, so, you know, the purposeful breaking of rules is, is something that we do do um, occasionally because sometimes you just can't, you can't get yourself out of something. And you talk to the fans maybe to an unusual degree on Twitter. And, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, some, some drama producers do it in the, in the UK, but invariably they sort of, you know, they, they quit every other year in a half and then join a year later, you know. But you stick with it and you engage with it. But is, yeah. can you do that too much? You know, yeah. you, you don't want to be too led by the fans. No, it's, it's really, it's a, such a strange relationship because it's, um, you know, at its healthiest, and, and this is the part that people enjoy and this is why we do it. At its healthiest, it's a forum and a community, you know, so that I'm getting to follow and read some of the people who watch the show and have watched it for years and kind of sense what their love is for it and when they're love starts to wane and you know and what they're responding to and then watch them build a community with each other and you just feel that energy uh, the communal energy the creative energy and it's beautiful you know I didn't ever have that when I was a kid I could never have contacted a showrunner I didn't even know what a showrunner was you know these kids now they know exactly what our job titles are and exactly what it means and it's hilarious like they think they know everything um, and they're pretty smart <laughs> but uh <laughs> The downside of it is just that sort of the faction of people. And, you know, I think they're a small faction. I hope they're a small faction. Um, otherwise, we're all doomed. But, uh, you know, they're just incredibly, they, they exist to attack. They exist to make you feel badly about yourself. They will instigate wars and fights with others. And they, get, they, they hit below the belt. They hit, they hit you know, about race, they hit about physical looks, they hit about, you know, anything that you can think of that would hurt your feelings, um, they will hit you with it, and they hit each other with it, and it's, it's a dark, dark faction that I hate, and you'll see, every time there's a new show, and I see the showrunner online, on Twitter, and they're so sweet, and they're like, retweeting everything, and engage. I'm like, oh, you poor sucker, you don't know what you're getting into, <laughs> and then, like, I'll watch, and it's usually, it's about, it's about, early in season three, when you watch the tide start to turn and you watch them all of a sudden, like I went through this, you watch them being like, hey guys, no reason to be nasty, you know, like, and then you're like, oh, it started. <laughs> and then, you know, eventually they're like, I think I'm gonna sign off for a while. You know? <laughs> and I just, I watch the journey and I'm like, yep, that's how it goes, like clockwork. Do you try and manage it? Or do you try and, you know, have some kind of 
you know, guiding role and say, you know, <clears throat> tell these people to calm down or stop, or, or do you just have to, is it never going to change? I've, I have gone on <laughs> so many rants about bullying and about, you know, and about trying to keep it classy and trying to be good to <coughs> each other, and it never fails. Like, every time I do it, they find a reason to yell at me louder. Like, oh, the, the, tweet, that I, the tweet that I retweeted to say, this is not okay, please don't talk like this to each other, you know, um, is me now targeting a specific fandom. Now, how dare you? How dare you retweet that when that other fandom is meaner than we are? And look at this. And so it's like you step your foot in and you're like, ah! So I've learned to actually, I don't, the sad part of it is, is I don't read the, my, like the mentions. You know, the, that's how usually people can talk to me. I don't read those anymore. Every now and then I'll like go through and I'll like skim and I'll try to avoid landmines of like I see the word, you know, hack writer. I'm like, no, don't look at that, you know. Um, but I've I've lost that connection with the with the fandom in that way because it's just it's too hurtful. You can't you get in there. You're like, I can't go about my day if I read this. So I'm gonna just step back. Okay, which is a shame because 95 percent of the good. Yes. Lost of 5% of yeah, the and so that's yeah. why I haven't quit, you know. I don't quit completely because there is so much good, and so I do try to, I do try to engage with the good as often as I can. But, you know, if I, if I need to be in a good mood on a day, I can't go into that, you know, into that part of, of Twitter and uh, subject myself to the kind of stuff that I get. Okay, well, I think we should look uh, at the third show, third clip we're going to see today, um, <clears throat> excuse me, which is, uh, which is Julia's 2016 drama. It was a remake of the Belgian TV series Cordon, and you can see it on all four now uh, in the UK, and it's called Containment. So this was di a different scene for you for, for many reasons. It's away from the supernatural universe. It was a, it was a remake of a, of, of, of a Belgian series, as yeah. I mentioned. How did, how did this come about? This came about uh, just a general meeting with, with Warner Brothers, and I had said, oh, I'm too busy to do anything but let's talk anyway, because, you know, I, as a girl likes to be invited to the party, even if she can't come. Um, and, then we, uh, and then we basically, uh, sorry, I just got distracted by the iPad. Aww. A question's coming, right. We have to skip tomorrow, people. That's sad. Um, I'll try to work yeah. it in. <laughs> I, I, yeah. So basically, um, I, I said, I was talking about the kind of television programming I like to make, and, you know, I love to tell stories of like ordinary people in an extraordinary circumstance. And you, you, I like family drama and relationship drama and that kind of stuff, love stories. But it's really hard to do that in American television right now, um, you know, without a concept, without a hook. So for me, it's vampires or now it's virus. And I happen to love outbreak stories. I love the book The Stand as a kid, um, Stephen King's novel. And then I also love, you know, Contagion and stuff like that. So they they handed this format to me and I watched it and I thought it was magnificent. Uh, and you said it's actually the show you're most proud of, is that, is that right? Yeah, you know, it's like, it's my, it's my grown up, it's like, it's my first grown up job, you know? I mean, Vampire Diaries, I was brand new. I didn't know what I was doing and I was a kid and I was partnered with Kevin and then, and then Originals was really, you know, still had its roots in the Vampire Diaries universe and so I'm super proud of all that stuff but this was the first time that I said, okay, this is, there's no vampires, there's no, you know, there ended up being, plenty of sexy people, but that wasn't the point, you know? And, uh, and to tell a really dark, rich, cool story. And I loved, I loved the source material so much. Uh, and then I was so proud of the execution um, for the, by the whole team. And yet, unfortunately, it hasn't. Yes! No. <laughs> Here's the twist. <laughs> Here's the twist. They, they're not, they, the, it's a one and done, you know, it's the one season. And, and that was the, the disappointment, I think, for me, is that I made something that I think is wonderful. And, and, and it was such a joy to make. The, the cast was so committed. The writing team was incredible. The production team was incredible. And we all loved the show so much. Um, but, you know, it's, it was a really interesting lesson for me because it was the first time in my career that I realized it doesn't matter how good something is. It's the, it's the context of the moment and where it fits and where it doesn't fit. And, you know, if I, I, I always say I woke up the morning of the, LA, of the New York upfronts um, to find that the entire landscape of television had changed underneath me in a way that they say that the movie business has over the years, where like you, suddenly it's like if you're not a franchise, a sequel, you know, based on a toy, a game, uh, a superhero, whatever, um, then you don't get made. And I looked at the television, I looked at the CW uh, lineup at their upfronts, and it was all the superheroes, and it was you know Supergirl, of course, had just joined, and I thought, okay, that that makes sense, you know. We made a good show, the network loved it, the studio loved it, 
everyone who was involved in it loved it, but that wasn't enough. And that changing TV environment, does that mean there's le less opportunity now for, for original stories? Or? Well, I mean, look, there's like 957 channels now, and you know, each of them are programming. So I think that, I think that it's a, a little bit, the, it's the new frontier in terms of like, you can go anywhere and tell a story anywhere, um, and yet it still weirdly feels as competitive and, and, and dangerous as, as if there were only three networks. Right, right. And it's good news for Greg Belanti. All about superheroes. Yeah, you know? yeah. Oh, no, he's doing great. <laughs> I'm having a midlife crisis. He's doing great. <laughs> well, you have got a new commission, which we're going to talk about in a bit. But, okay. uh, but, uh, but, but before we do, uh, as you just saw in the iPad, we're not going to talk about tomorrow, people. Okay. We'll do that tomorrow. That was sad. Do that tomorrow, people. <laughs> um, um, but uh, I wanted to talk a bit about diversity yeah. uh, in, 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 in women in television. You've directed two episodes of um, yes. Vampire Diaries. Uh, well, so tell us how that went, but also, I mean, it is, it is a, big, a big thing at the minute about the number of uh, w women showrunners yeah. in Hollywood. I think a recent survey said 22% of uh, the, the kind of showrunners in, in Hollywood were, were women. But, uh, you know, there's no, there's no reason for this, is there? But it's, it's changing, but it seems to be changing very slowly. Yeah, you know, I mean, the thing is, is it's, I read some obnoxious comment, which is like, oh, you know, we, you know, we try, but we'll just keep trying harder. And you're like, well, come on, man, like, you know. It's easy for you to say, you're a man, that's cool. Um, I haven't run into any of those problems myself because I'm on a network which is, you know, I think almost, you know, probably 75% of their shows are, are helmed by women, which is great, you know. Um, I think that I had to make a commitment to myself recently. I went to, um, Greg actually was getting honored by um, women in film, and they, it was all about diversity and, and his commitment to diversity. And I sat through this entire night and heard all these speeches, all these really incredible women um, and women of color who were talking about like trying to break in through, uh, break into directing and break into writing. And I thought, God, I'm not doing enough either. Like, and so with, with Vampire Diaries specifically, um, when we entered our eighth and final season, it was sort of like, well, this is the time where the actors are all directing and the crew all wants to direct. And this is the time where we should really celebrate our team and, and, and and, and give them this gift of like you know raising them up to that level because um, that's what how I, how I like to do business is to grow people from within. And then I thought, oh, I can't do it. You know, I've got to make sure that we are populated by plenty of women and plenty of people of color. You know, because as someone as it was Michael Robertson, executive at the CW, said to me, if we keep talking about change but we don't actually make change, then what are we doing? You know. And I said, okay, I get it. And that's ultimately what we've tried to adopt. And that is the point. You know. Um, yes, it can be uncomfortable in an eighth year of a show working with someone you've never met before and knowing that it's going to take extra work and all that. But like, okay, that's what we're supposed to be doing. And so I made this commitment to myself and then was able to deliver on it. And so I feel pretty good about that. Okay. Well, I mentioned that new commission. It would be great to ask you about it. I think yeah. it was announced in the last 24 hours or so. It's a, it's a, it's a martial law drama called, called Rise. Tell, tell us about it. Yeah. So um, I wanted to make sure that I gave an opportunity for the people that work on Vampire Diaries to have another job to go to, um, which, you know, it's a crapshoot. Everything you do in, 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 when you sell a pilot idea is a crapshoot because it's got, you know, at the time you sell it, it's got a 1% chance of actually like, making it past season one. Um, but uh, so I worked, I, I came up with an idea with two of the guys that run, that are executive producers on Vampire Diaries and we were talking about the things that we love. And the things that I love uh, are Hamilton. Anything about Hamilton is like, it just makes me happier than anything. And the things that we collectively loved, we had a collective love for history uh, and the movie Red Dawn, which I don't know if any of you have ever seen it. It's terrible, but it's <laughs> such a, it's a, like a quintessential teenage experience. Like it, it basically, it's about, um, at this point, it's a communist takeover in a small town. It, like the communists come to America, which of course is everyone's fear in the '80s. And uh, and they, these kids are sitting in high school, and all of a sudden they look out the window, and in the quad, all these people are like paratrooping out of the sky and from helicopters. And it's like ah, war. And these kids run into the mountains and then decide to fight back to take back their town. And um, and it's awesome. So we started with Red Dawn and Hamilton, and we ended. And then and also we we were like, and the political climate, of course, in America right now is freaking terrifying and so you know we're like we worked a little bit with like when we all moved to Canada um, <laughs> like or what else are our options if, if, if this doesn't go the way we'd like it to um, we uh, we came up with this idea about a front sort of Friday night light small town uh, and the very beginning of the show is a terrorist um, 
what appears to be a terrorist event, um, which these small, these normal people in this normal small town start to kind of compare notes and say, wait a second, like, that's what I'm seeing on the news isn't what I saw on the ground. And what they're saying on the streets, what the military is saying isn't what we kind of know. And they realize very quickly that there's been um, a, a homegrown domestic coup that has taken over the government and that they alone are privy to that knowledge. And so we, we talk about how these people are ultimately going to be the new founding fathers and mothers of uh, a new constitution by the end of the series. And, but in the beginning, like in Hamilton, um, they're just a bunch of young scrappy people who um, realize that they don't like what's happening in their country. Okay, well you mentioned a, a terrifying political, politi pardon me, you didn't mention it that way, you mentioned yes. a terrifying political climate, do you want to expand on that at yes. all? Yes, well I mean, what I do you make like, of what's going on right now? I don't know, I, I don't know where everyone's politics lie in this room, but you know, most of us in Hollywood are definitively settled, at least in the middle, if not the left, and, um, and, and then you know, of course we've got Trump who's <laughs> over there. And you know, it's just it's fascinating because we we talk about this creatively all the time because you start to understand where people like what gets people so heated and where our differences truly lie and you know and and when you're on the internet and you're reading comments and you're reading the people who are fighting back, you know, you post something like, "Yay, I'm with her." And and then 90 people are like, "She's a criminal. Trump is Great, and you're like, oh my God, who are these people? But you realize, like, we get so isolated as creative people in our little, like, blue state, East Coast, West Coast universe. There's an entire middle of the country that doesn't speak, we don't speak the same language, and yet we are doing programming for the whole country. And so it makes sense why certain shows, like, hit and last forever and other you know shows just that maybe are extremely critically acclaimed will just kind of collapse um, so it's a, it's important for us all to remember okay. uh, uh, remember who, who we're writing for okay great we've got time for a few questions and uh, before I come to you guys I just want to ask uh, one question which is coming via the app which is um, uh, what is the biggest misconception about your job Jill oh um, Hmm. I don't know if there's misconceptions about the job. I think people just don't necessarily know what it is. I mean, we throw around the term showrunner like, you know, like it's, you know, postman. But if you said that to anybody on the street, they'd be like, I don't know. Twitter they know, but anybody else on the street wouldn't know. Um, and so I think it's, you know, when, I, when I'm asked what it is, I just say I'm kind of the, the arbiter of everything. I'm the one that will sign off on every decision getting made. I don't necessarily have to make the decision, but I gotta be cool with the decision. Uh, I'm responsible for every minute of film that gets shot and every person that works for me and every piece of the story that gets told, and I do it all. But if I'm doing my job well, then actually everyone else is doing most of it for me. You know, so um, that's, uh, that's the gig. Okay, uh, and uh, we can put the lights up, and we've got some microphones in the room as well. If, uh, if you guys have got any questions, we're great to hear from you. I've got some more questions here on email and via the app, but uh, I don't want to ignore you guys. Right, there's one there right in the middle, if, uh, if we can take a mic microphone over there. Yeah. No, we should, use, we should use the mic, oh. otherwise they won't. Thank you, Julie, for coming. It's been inspirational for Oh, thank you. <laughs> Just hearing you talk about show running, um, this might be a very difficult question. I'm Vicky Pepperdine, by the way. Hello. Great to meet you. Hi. <laughs> um, if you had a top tip for a showrunner in the States, particularly female, what would that be? Um, I think that it's particularly female. Somebody who's being a bit insensitive to talking about why more women aren't showrunners talks about how, how difficult it is to balance a family and, um, and having kids and being a mother with doing the sort of 24 seven application of the job. And what I've said you know, publicly is it's easy for me, easier for me because I don't have any of that. So I'm a dreadful workaholic who will just throw myself into work and never you know, come up for air only to have wine with a friend every now and then. Um, but what I've said to women who are like, I don't know if I should, I say, the part of being a showrunner is that you make your own rules and you make your own time clock. And if you can, if you can 
be right with that and get right with that and know that like some asshole is going to turn his nose up at your schedule, that's too bad for him because you, the job is 24 seven, but you've got to figure out how to get it done within the pockets of time that you have. And if from two in the afternoon to 4.30 in the afternoon every day, you need to be with your kid, then you're with your kid and everyone else can deal. And if you need to go home at six and put your kids to bed and be a parent, then you do that. And then you go back to work at eight, you know? And as long as kid and work are your two things, then you can get it done. You just have to be confident in setting your own boundaries of what that schedule needs to look like and not a, being an apologist for it. And you know, we, we as women are, of course, apologists for everything. Um, but that is, the, the, you do the job when you're not doing your other job. And you just find ways to get that done. And anybody who doesn't like the way you're doing it, it's too bad because you're in charge. <laughs> <laughs> And I think we've got time, just one more question from the floor. For, yep, that's great. Uh, thank you. Hi. Uh, first, I just want to say I'm a huge fan of all your shows, <laughs> so it's really great and inspirational to hear you speak. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about your relationship with the fans. I mean, you're one of the probably most visible showrunners in terms of those shows which have had teen-skewing audiences, and there's been a lot of conversation about fan service and entitlement and the relationships that fans have with their creators, and I wondered whether or not you think that access to showrunners is a right or a privilege. Like, there are some fans who think that they should have access, and I wanted to know what your opinion was. You know, it's funny to say, I have a million opinions about this, which range on my mood and who's insulted me most, most <laughs> recently. Um, but without that context, I'll just say, you know, I, to say it's a right or a privilege makes me feel a little snotty. So I, 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 because ultimately I'm just another person on Twitter. But I do feel there's a, this sense of, of freedom to be hostile that, um, that isn't necessary. Because if you, were, if you were to sit in this room, if we were all together in person, I don't know that you'd stand up and be like, listen, you, you suck, and you're horrible, and rah, you know? You'd probably phrase your statement, your criticism, or your, you know, your observation in a respectful way. And so if that's what we can expect from each other in a social group when we're all staring at each other, then I feel like we should be able to expect that online, even under the guise of anonymity, some sort of point of view that is not um, incendiary, you know? And that's where Twitter and social media has really lost its way, um, is that because it's anonymous, people feel the freedom to just be cruel to get a rise out of someone to make their point. It's just a culture of bullies, and I feel like that's where the entitlement, I guess, you know, comes from is I is fans that kind of get popular in their own mind by being by being mean to, you know, like gaining friends by being mean to others. It's just like high school. And I just think it's sad. Julie, I have to sneak in one more question which yeah. just came in online. I've got to ask for a brief answer, I'm afraid, sorry, uh, if that's possible. <laughs> Is there any chance uh, for the Steriline June, wed <laughs> June wedding in the last Speaking series? Speaking of fan service, but yeah. that's the good, to me, that's the good fan service. That's when you're like, oh, this is cute. People notice something we did in the first episode of the series that we might want to live up to by the last, and that's all I'll say. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.